Yoda bringing in the big guns, America's number two on his way to KC. The planes are taking off at the airport, so is the price. Could Kansas City's new look KCI cost twice as much? How much is a World Series trophy worth? Frank White's just sold this week. Why there's angst over the baseball legend and political leader selling his storied staff. Plus, UMKC's new leader now on the job, and Missouri's new governor tries his hand at national TV. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marley Scorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Delighted to have you back. We survived the holiday, didn't we? Some of you may still be in holiday mode, still celebrating America's independence from the British, but do not fear. We are here to make your life easier in 30 minutes or less. We take you through the local news you might have missed while your mind was on burgers and brats, pools and parades, fireworks and frivolity, avoiding all those temptations and libations to ensure they're on top of their game. Our this week's news reviewer, star editorialist and host of up to date on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske, getting up earlier than anyone should ever have to to deliver your local news, Fox 4 Morning News anchor Mark Alford, pitch contributing writer Barbara Shelley, and star columnist and editorial writer Dave Helling. Two weeks ago on this program, we shared with you how construction on the new $1 billion terminal at KCI is delayed with opening day pushback by a year. Now we're told the project will cost more than 40% more. The new look KCI is now estimated to cost $1.4 billion. We know they're adding four more gates than previously planned, but do gates cost $100 million each, Mark Alford? Boy, that's a tough question. I know that one thing in all this is Citizens for Responsible Government, as much guff as they took on this leading up to the election of this, I think they're going to end up being right on some of these items. It's a cost overrun. It's taking longer to get it done. The question is, will us, will we the taxpayers end up paying anything? We were promised we would not have to pay uh, one red cent for the airport. And is that still the case, Dave? Yes. Yes. It'll be paid for by people who fly, uh, who will pay extra on their tickets, five, six, seven dollars a ticket, which is not inconsiderable, but that's who's paying for these improvements. I don't think anyone doubted that the price would go up, Nick, primarily because the number that was used during the campaign was based on a 2015 study. It is three years later. It isn't just gates. It involves a bigger terminal, some other improvements that need to be made. The Trump tariffs will add to the cost of steel and aluminum. So the price going up is a concern because it's a huge jump, 40%. But it is not fatal. It's not something that you need to have a new vote on. The, the bigger problem is the delay. Because if you're already a year behind before you've turned one shovel of dirt, uh, that, that's a warning sign that everyone involved needs to pick up the pace a little bit. Mark Alford mentioned the group Citizens for Responsible Government. They say $1.4 billion is what they're saying now. It could get even higher than that. It could be $2 billion, twice as much, Steve. I think that becomes a problem when you double the cost of a project like this. I think that will set people wondering about what, how much trust they can have in City Hall when promises got made about this thing. But again, to underscore a couple points here, taxpayers will not be on the hook for this thing. And maybe a second warning shot here. I think the developer here of this project needs to take a caution here and, and really begin to uh, embrace this idea of transparency going forward. That group really needs to be upfront with Kansas City voters about what might lie ahead we, here. Edgemore, we just made Edgemore, that clear. Yes. Edgemore is the developer. And you know, City Councilman, Quentin Lucas talking about that this week. He's tweeting, I'm not calling for anyone's job today, but now more than ever, Barbara, transparency seems essential for public confidence. Is there really a lack of transparency here? Or as we talked about in, in the past on this program, this is just a very complicated, mm -hmm. complex public project, and it, it can be more difficult and more expensive than we think. Well, it is a complicated project, but 
it, there's been sort of a mystery about the process and the numbers and all of that right from the get-go on this project. And, and I think, you know, I, I think people still don't know what Edgemore is and who they are and, and what they're doing. And, you know, now these costs are going up and while the deadline's pushing back. I, I think Steve's right. I think, you know, there has to be a way to square with the public about, you know, a timeline, what's going to happen, what to expect. Well, one of the things we talked about in, in an editorial is Pat Klein, who's the aviation director, may not be perfectly suited for this task. Now, we're not, you know, we don't want to see Pat Klein out on the street. He, he should have a job at the city. He's actually worked very hard on this project and has the city's best interests at heart. But this is a once really in a several generation project. And you may need someone at the head of the aviation department who has some experience in rebuilding terminals. And that may suggest a replacement at some point for Pat. And then I add this. The city council has ultimate oversight of, over all of this, but city council members are not experts in airport development either. So we've suggested mm -hmm. an airport authority, maybe just mm -hmm. in Kansas City, but some sort of independent civilian appointed board that would do nothing but pay attention to this project and hold everyone accountable, and I think the city should consider that as well. And board, the developers, did hold a lot of listening sessions all across Kansas City to listen to members of the public. One question all public hearing participants were asked to answer during those KCI mm -hmm. listening sessions was, what one word, place or phrase says Kansas City to you? Now, I have the answers right here, mm. but I want to reveal those top answers in just a moment because <laughs> I want to hear our panelists what one word <laughs> says Kansas City to Mark Alford. Since I'm always thinking food, barbecue. Barbecue? Yes. Barbara Shelley. Uh, you said phrase. I could use a phrase. You right? could say a okay. phrase or a place. Two words. Lurching forward. Mm. Everything's mm. hard, but we are making progress. <laughs> yeah, that's really catchy. Lurching yeah, forward. I know. forward. Dave. Uh, I would say uh, the word Alford uh, defines Kansas City for many people, but Thanks, for Dave. others, <laughs> <laughs> others, family. I think yeah. this is one of the most family friendly True. metropolitan areas in the country. Doesn't mean we don't have problems with violent crime and other, uh, uh, you know, substandard housing, but by and large, this is a family friendly friendly community and that defines it. That was Steve. more than one word. Yeah, yeah it sure was. Yeah. That was yeah. a paragraph. A he does that. Man. <laughs> Three tweets worth from yeah. Dave Helling. Jazz. I think when, when you go around the world, when people think of our community, and that's what we're talking about here, people flying in from around the world to Kansas City, they yeah. think of jazz. We ought, ought to offer it to them right at that airport. Okay, this is what our panelists said. Well, what did you say? Well, what was the top answer then from Kansas City and attending those countless listening sh sessions? What did they say Kansas City means to you? Well, the top answer, Union Station. And number two, the huh. plaza, runners up, the Truman Sports Complex, mm. barbecue, fountains, and 18th and Vine. So that's jazz. Mm. Does that mean they will now try to incorporate all of these features uh, into the new terminal? Uh, I think there will be an effort to give it a Kansas City-centric focus. Um, but I, I don't think that they'll spend a lot of money on, you know, jazz clubs or that type of mm. thing that might really emphasize that because they don't have a lot of money to do those things. And there will be some criticism if they go forward. But there will, there will certainly be a Kansas City flavor. Maybe the stores the that are moving out of the plaza will move to the new airport. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever, yeah. Mark. Okay, last week voters in Oklahoma went to the polls and approved legalizing medicinal marijuana. The vote came just days after the Canadian Parliament voted to make marijuana legal nationwide, we'll know shortly whether you'll be voting on pot here. Election officials are verifying the signatures on four separate measures that could appear on the November ballot in Missouri. Three involve medical marijuana, a fourth would legalize pot for personal and medicinal uses. Now, while we wait on that, one issue we do know you'll be voting on in just a matter of weeks is right to work. That's now been added to the August ballot in the state of Missouri. Missourians know how to spot a good idea, and Right to Work is one of them. Right to Work means more freedom and more choices for Missouri workers. You guys know Prop A is coming up on the ballot this year. The proponents of it say we're being forced to be a union shop. Couldn't be farther from the truth. The only thing I've been forced to do is maybe eat a donut every now and then. All righty, two ads for and against Proposition A on your August ballot. Am I the only one who thought Right to Work 
was already decided. Didn't Missouri lawmakers pass a law last year blocking companies from requiring workers to join a union or pay union fees, Steve? You know, you're not wrong, Nick, and this is very confusing. Lawmakers yeah. did pass a right to work law last year, but it was frozen in place because unions immediately uh, began to circulate petitions to put the issue on the ballot in front of voters. It'll be on uh, the ballot in August. So it froze that initial vote in place, Nick. So after all of those millions of dollars that were spent uh, trying to lobby the lawmakers last year, none of it has actually gone into effect, Barbara. It has not to this point, but what Proposition A is, is also a, an initiative attempt to kind of, um, you know, put right to work into the Constitution so that it's it's settled. For now, no, I, I did notice, too, <laughs> when we talked about KCI <laughs> Airport, that there's still a dispute over labor there, and there is an effort to make 100% of all of the workers working at the airport be unionized. But, but going back to this, if this passes, it, wouldn't it be the case that the, the airport couldn't hire 100% union workers because it is a right well, to work? Well, let, let's back up a little bit. There, negotiations continue on the labor agreement at KCI. In fact, meetings are scheduled for next week, and I am told they are moving closer to an agreement because the unions have moved off the 100% okay. requirement, but there is still disagreement over how much can be non-union labor. There is a no-strike agreement in place, so that may get worked out over time. The, the Edgemore has always pledged, and Clark Construction, which is part of Edgemore, has always pledged to pay union wages to everyone on the project, even non-union workers. So right to work will have a lesser impact, perhaps, on the airport than other projects. But your viewers should know this, Nick. It, the, the ballot is weird because if you, in essence, want the status quo, you vote no. <laughs> but if you want right to work to be enacted, you vote yes. And there may be some confusion from people who think, well, I want to vote against right to work, and they don't know which way to cast the ballot. And that's what we have to keep yeah, our eyes and, on. And to compound the confusion, right to work really isn't about union participation in projects like KCI. It's about whether workers who choose not to be in the union still have to pay the dues because they're reaping the benefits that the union secures for them. Which was recently decided by the U.S. Supreme Court for the public, public. Yeah. sector, not the private sector, which leads to even more confusion. Exactly. Vice President Mike Pence is headed to Kansas City. Why, you ask? Well, he'll be here on, uh, to raise money for Kansas Congressman Kevin Yoder. A copy of the invitation states that attendees will pay $1,000 for the luncheon with the Vice President. Couples paying $5,400 can have a photo with him. What does Pence's visit say about the status of the Kevin Yoder campaign, Steve? Well, it says that he is a little bit vulnerable when you have the Vice President coming out to Kansas to campaign for a candidate. It suggests they need to shore him up a little bit. I've said it on this program before, Nick. I think Kevin Yoder qualifies as the most vulnerable incumbent in the metropolitan area this cycle. Having said that, Democrats have a big decision to make in August as to who's going to challenge Kevin Yoder. There's an age-old maxim in politics, Nick. You've got to beat somebody with somebody. And so who's going to beat Kevin Yoder? That's what Democrats have to decide in August. Does Kevin Yoder really need the money, though, Barbara? I was looking through at his last campaign filing report, and he shows he has nearly two a million dollars on hand. Does he really need the money from a luncheon with the vice president? I know he's absolutely flush, but I guess they think he does because, you know, the vice no, president is here and it's a big fundraiser. And yeah, I guess you can always run, run one more TV ad. It's possible that some of the money raised by the vice president will go to the state party and not all of it go to Kevin Yoder. That's typically how these things work. And uh, vice presidents have come out before. I remember Dick Cheney has come out. Joe Biden comes out to raise money. I mean, that's kind of what vice presidents do. Um, and, and while Steve's right that you have to beat somebody with somebody, the Democratic field a month out is very muddled in the third district. Mm -hmm. No one has really emerged as the front runner. That suggests that the best chance for the Democrats to take that seat is a, a Democratic wave across the country in which the candidate doesn't matter quite as much as just revulsion with the Republican Party or the party in power. And there's no sign of that yet in the third district. So I think Mike Pence is coming out to give a bit of a just a booster shot to the campaign and not a sign of panic. It is the first week of July, and that is the traditional start date for new laws in Kansas. And this year brings plenty. Good Samaritans who break windows to get a child 
or pet out of a hot car are now protected from lawsuits going forward for some people. That may be a little surprising, but up until now, if you broke a vehicle window to rescue an overheating baby or a puppy, you could be slapped with a lawsuit and certainly forced to pay for the window, Mark? Yes, and in a lot of cases we've seen where children or pets have been harmed or even died because left in hot cars. My question in all this, is there a, a floor for the temperature in the car if it's 60 degrees outside? Not that you want to leave a child in a car, but a pet, maybe you run into a quick trip and some overzealous pet lover comes out and starts breaking your window. <laughs> who, who pays for that? So that's uh, something to be thinking about with this new law. Also going into effect this week, by the way, police in Kansas can no longer have sex during traffic stops. Believe it or not, that was not illegal before now. And people who make false emergency calls claiming a violent crime is happening now face felony charges in Kansas. Also going into effect this week, a new law allowing faith-based adoption agencies to turn away gay and lesbian couples based on religious beliefs. We get the impression that little gets done in our state capitals, but clearly lots of bills do get passed that impact your life in very important ways, Steve. Oh, it's amazing, Nick, uh, the impact of state government. And I find that too often voters really sort of overlook the goings on in Topeka and Jeff City. They seem like distant places, far removed from their daily lives. But if you want to go to a place that directs, directly impacts your life all the time, there's your state capitals for you. Now, Missouri Governor Mike Parson on the other side of state line this week wraps up his first month on the job, and he celebrates by appearing on national television on the Mike Huckabee talk show. You know, I always say, you know, when I was pumping gas and fixing tires, nobody ever wondered how the photograph with me. <laughs> and now, you know, I'm on your show. Uh, one of the things that impressed me was that prior to your swearing in, you did something that I thought was very admirable. You wanted to have a prayer service. Of all the titles I've had, there's none more important than being a Christian. Shortly after he took office, Governor Parson headed to Kansas City and pledged to spend a full day here eyeballing the city's challenges. But the promise came with a caveat. He'll come here if Mayor Sly James promises to spend a day in rural Missouri. Has the mayor taken him up on the offer, Dave Helling? Not that we're aware of, but it sounds like a pretty good trade, and I think Sly James would be up for that. I, you know, I think there should be and can be a greater do a dialogue between rural areas and urban areas in Missouri particularly since rural areas tend to favor legislation that impacts urban areas on things like weapons, minimum wage, that type of thing that cities think they can do a better job of handling, at least big cities. So anything that uh, facilitates that dialogue is a good thing. And the first place Mike Parson should go as the new governor if he was to head to Kansas City for a day is where, Barbara? I would send him to the um, administration building of Kansas City Public Schools to have a chat mm -hmm. with Superintendent Bedell. Right. Mark. I would send him to the Morning Store Baptist Church. Pastor Modest Miles doing a great job at their new family center, helping kids get off in the right direction. Then I'd go down to the plaza, and since they may not have a stoli doli at Capitol Grill, but that'd be a nice way at 2 o'clock <laughs> to... Dave. Well, this is, will sound strange, but I'd send him here to Channel 19 and do a half-hour show to introduce himself to the people of Kansas City who may have no idea who Mike Parson is or what he believes. I think he'd do great in that forum. I think he'd do better than he would do with, say, Mike Huckabee, which has a certain, uh, you know, a, a turnoff factor for some people as a partisan thing. Uh, come on over here and talk to the people of Kansas City, Governor, and you'll learn some stuff. He could also come to KCUR's up to date. Or KCUR's sure up to date. <laughs> or the Star's <laughs> editorial <laughs> board. Yeah. I should point out, Steve together. Kraske, you said he should also head to UMKC, which this week sees a new chancellor on the job. Why does he need to step up onto the campus of Kansas City's hometown university? Well, so many reasons, Nick, and I should tell your viewers that I work over there. I teach uh, on campus, but he needs to meet our new chancellor, Molly Agrawal. I hear he's a great guy. He needs to come look at the UMKC Music Conservatory that is in such bad shape and needs to be replaced, has been in the news so much. He needs to come meet some of our students, uh, many of whom work a full-time job and take a full-time load of classes. They're incredible people. And he needs to look at a faculty parking lot, and he'll quickly realize that <laughs> members of the faculty aren't the gloriously paid public servants that so many uh, lawmakers think they are. Barbara. <laughs> Let's just back up for a minute um, about <laughs> Sly James visiting rural Missouri. I don't really see the point of that. I mean, Sly James is the mayor of Kansas City. Mike Parson is the governor of Missouri, which includes Kansas City, right. as well as rural areas. So, so you're rejecting the premise, well, are you? Okay. I am kind of rejecting the premise. Okay.
Dave, so why would okay well, why would me. it make sense for Mayor Sly James? But he is somebody who makes big concern about issues like guns, which is a very different one in a rural area where it would take longer, for instance, for law enforcement to actually uh, come and rescue you if you were in a emergency situation. Right. And just so we're clear, reasonable people can disagree on this, and Barb is certainly a reasonable person. No, I think uh, it's more symbolic than anything else. She's right. He is only the mayor of Kansas City, but to the extent that people in rural Missouri believe that urban areas are listening to their concerns, perhaps, maybe this much of a chance, but perhaps they'll understand that urban areas feel they're being mm -hmm. slighted as well. Dialogue is always good. I'd see no well, harm. I just think it shows a, a bias on Governor Parsons part toward rural Missouri. Well, I'll come, I'll deign to come to Kansas yes. City if you go into I, my I tell you area. what, Barbara, so we can resolve this, yeah. I will I will talk to him <laughs> about that when he comes on for his special 30-minute program that uh, Dave Helling has just broken <laughs> for. Well, we talked right. about it a few yeah. weeks ago on this program, now it's official. As most Kansas Cityans were focused on brats, beer, picnics, parades, and fireworks, Mayor Sly James kicks off the campaign for a new sales tax to fund preschool for four-year-olds. Not a single city council member or school district superintendent was at the announcement, which will ask voters in November to approve a three-eighths of a cent hike in the city sales tax to generate $30 million a year for tuition assistance and additional spots in pre-K programs. A family of four earning less than $50,000 would pay nothing. There's a sliding scale of subsidies for families earning more than that. Was it bad timing that no member of the city council or school superintendent was present? Or is that a signal that they're unhappy with the campaign, Dave Halley? Well, they're unhappy with Sly James. It's not necessarily the campaign. And really, the mayor returns the favor by being unhappy with the council. There, It's very clear that there is a very uh, uh, deep division between, roughly speaking, the council political community and the mayor himself. Uh, and, and it's also clear, Nick, I was at the announcement, that the mayor hopes to convince voters to support this through the force of his own personality. His picture is on the campaign literature. He was the only speaker at this uh, uh, announcement. Uh, they're going to do it by petition. They're not even going to the city council to try and put this on the ballot. This mm. is all on Sly James, and he's pretty popular. It may, it may just work. But he also actually made the announcement uh, just before the 4th of July holiday. It didn't attract a huge amount of television right. or news attention. Uh, taxes are a very troubling thing for a lot of people, especially when you get your sales tax rate approaching 10 percent. We're also facing a, a ballot initiative for uh, an increase in gas tax, Jackson County tax is going up. So uh, while this may be well-intentioned, a good proposal to help kids get a fresh new start that otherwise would not have, I don't see this passing. You know, Dave is right. The mayor is very popular. But tr traditionally, when it comes to these kinds of kickoffs for a sales tax of this size, Nick, you know, three-eighths of a cent is, is not a small change here. You would build, you'd have a coalition with you at the kickoff. You'd have your superintendents. You'd have your city council members. The fact the mayor's not doing that suggests to me he's taking a bit did of a gamble. Did that bother you, Barbara? Yeah, it did. I would have felt a lot better about it if he at least had school leaders no standing beside him to, 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 you know, to kind of explain how this is going to work. The school, just quickly, school leaders are lukewarm about this proposal. City council members are lukewarm about it. The east side is lukewarm about it because sales taxes are regressive. The mayor thinks through the force of his own personality he can get this across the finish line. It's a very, very tough lift, but not impossible. You may have seen the news that Royals legend and current Jackson County executive Frank White has put on the auction block nearly 70 of his prized possessions, including the 1985 World Series trophy. Well, the auction is now closed. And what was that winning bid for that World Series trophy? How about $33,000? His 1980 gold gloves sold for $13,000 on a Lenexa-based sports auction website. The auction comes as the Missouri Attorney General's office confirms it's looking into White's finances. Are the two issues connected? I talked to Frank White yesterday. He said, look, this is totally non-related. He has how many? Eight gold gloves, something like that. He gave one to each of his children. They have them on their mantle. He says, I want to get rid of these things and sell them while they still have value. When I'm dead and gone, they're not going to have that much value. He says the only thing he cares about is his ring, uh, and he's keeping that. He says, uh, if I weren't Frank White, this would never be happening. Who ever heard of coming after a guy who is 
is paying his bills. So he's just uncluttering the house, Steve? Well, yes, but we should, probably should say, Nick, that he also faces some pretty serious questions. Uh, the Attorney General of the state of Missouri is investigating and taking a look at uh, one particular transaction, most likely, that involved uh, uh, an attorney from Independence, Ken McLean, who uh, pitched in and helped Frank White uh, make some house payments. He did that sort of surreptitiously uh, in a way that the public wouldn't have seen that payment. It's against county law, the county charter, for someone like Ken McLean, who does business with the county, to help out a county executive. So big questions remain here. Former Kansas City Mayor Kay Barnes honored this week with her name added to Kansas City's biggest ballroom. The two-term mayor is credited with leading the way on construction of Sprint Center and revitalizing downtown. The grand ballroom at the Bartle Hall Convention Center now bearing her name. But Steve, you are incredulous writing, come on Kansas City, we can do better than this. What, in your judgment, would be a more fitting honor? You know, her achievements grow with time, Nick. We see our downtown just uh, exploding uh, in, in recent years, all as a result of Mayor Barnes' work. Yeah, I don't know, Nick, renaming a bridge, renaming a thoroughfare through the Power and Light District, renaming the living room in the Power and Light District after the mayor. I know for, uh, from our reporting that there were serious efforts made to get some of this done, to hit unexpected roadblocks, but this bland, boring ballroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but you have Mark Funkhauser, who's also mayor. He's now leading Governing <laughs> Magazine in Washington, D.C. He still has nothing named after him, Mark. No. That's not Neither happening. Does, Gloria doesn't have anything named I, after her either. I can't yeah. think what they might name yeah. after him. But, um, yeah, Kay, Kay Barnes really amazes me. And, you know, it's not just the achievements that she did, which do grow with time. It's just the, the amount of class and grace that she brought no to that question. job. Well, we also don't want to have too big yeah. uh, an item named after her because we will have a, another mayor soon to leave office, <laughs> Sly James. We need something big for him too, don't we, Dave? Well, right. I mean, you've got Davis Park, Berkeley Park, uh, Bartle Hall. Hall, Cleaver, I mean, Boulevard. Just Cleaver Boulevard, just go down the list, except for Mark Funkhauser. Mm -hmm. Significant uh, parts of the community have been renamed for popular mayors. Uh, the next mayor will get that too. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers, keeping you weekdays up to date on KCUR-FM at 11 o'clock. Steve Kraske and from the pages of The Pitch, contributing writer Barbara Shelley, Fox 4 morning news anchor Mark Alford, and Dave L. Helling of your Kansas City Star. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.